moments here. Okay, so um, good morning. We're going to be uh, discussing today uh, a capstone topic that I uh, like to put at the end of uh, the material on uh, mathematics of, of uh, infectious disease models. Um, and normally this uh, follows one of two uh, patterns. Uh, either we explore aspects of uh, the numerical, numerical solution of these systems, or we explore aspects associated with the stability of equilibria. And while the syllabus anticipated the first, um, I decided to take a, a different tack and actually explore uh, the latter, namely uh, the issue of stability. Uh, this issue is um, mathematically uh, uh, somewhat dense, and uh, I'm going to ask for your accommodation in going through this material um, to uh, rather quickly to, to touch on a variety of, of specific mathematical understanding that I hope will, uh, will, will lend an appreciation uh, at an intuitive level for stability, but as well as will provide an, an understanding of um, the ways in which uh, we assess stability using mathematical tools afforded to us by the fact that, uh, that system dynamics models uh, are characterized by these ordinary uh, differential equations behind them. We have a precise mathematical characterization of these models in a way that affords us the opportunity to solve, uh, as we say, in closed form in many cases, um, providing formulas for not only the location of equilibria, but also their stability, the degree to which um, they will be uh, thrown off, say, by the arrival of infectives uh, within, within the area being modeled. And so we're going to be uh, exploring the particular mathematics behind that assessment, behind this assessment of stability. So each of those equilibria that we talked about last time and, and uh, presaged by comments in previous sessions, we'll be seeing how uh, through uh, computation of, of certain mathematical structures, most notably what's called the Jacobian matrix in which represents essentially a linearization of the system around uh, each equilibrium, uh, we can assess uh, whether that equilibrium is robust. This matters a great deal to our, our health system uh, because uh, while we may be comforting ourselves if we have very few cases of COVID-19 within Saskatoon at any one time, um, uh, you know, we're going to be setting ourselves up for a fall if with the arrival of uh, a plane with, with a vacationing family returning with, uh, with uh, a few cases amongst them, it throws the whole system into disarray and everything goes to hell in a handbasket in a few weeks. That would be uh, very disturbing. Um, instead, we like to uh, console ourselves with the fact that while we may be at the mercy of of always people arriving with COVID-19, we have a, a system that's robust, uh, that uh, if they do arrive, the system will handle the shock. It'll push back. It'll be elastic and bring it back into equilibrium. Um, so uh, in order to assess that, we make use of these mathematical tools and they can provide, in many cases, symbolic solutions, which give us formulas as to the conditions under which this stability, this robustness, this resiliency of the system is achieved. Um, but at the least, they provide us with ways across the board to numerically assess that. Um, so if we have a, a certain infection with certain characteristics, uh, say COVID-19, or perhaps it's tuberculosis, or perhaps it's a sexually transmitted infection like gonorrhea or chlamydia, um, we can assess the degree to which uh, the health system uh, has this resilience uh, that we call upon it to provide in the case of an outbreak. Um, so we'll see how to do that, but it will require a degree of fortitude on your part going through these uh, formulae. And to that end, I've just posted, even as I spoke to you, 
um, a copy of the slides uh, to Moodle. So you can go find these slides. And I would particularly recommend it today because uh, I'll be going uh, thick and fast through a set of slides on um, different aspects of the derivation, reflective of the fact that um, there's probably some building up of intuition that's needed for things such as matrix multiplication and uh, things that you may have encountered in linear algebra, such as diagonalization of a matrix through symmetry transforms um, may now be uh, long before, but behind you in your memory. And so we'll be going through some building up of that understanding and then really applying it squarely to linear and then nonlinear models. Um, and we'll finish our time together today, I'm hoping, with a characterization of how this applies to nonlinear models. Um, if a bit of that has to leak into our next session, um, so be it. Uh, but uh, it is important material. And indeed, uh, that application to nonlinear disease models is our quarry today, is, is the, the goal which we are, um, uh, which we are following. Um, okay, so with uh, that preface in mind, and uh, with you having uh, suffered the insults of my, uh, uh, my visage for, for too long now, I'm going to switch over to the, uh, to the slides here and uh, throw you out of the frying pan of um, uh, visual insult uh, into the, uh, the fire of uh, the mathematics involved. Um, Okay, uh, you folks can see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. A temporary respite. Uh, okay, um, so I want to remind you of some basic facts about uh, linearity. I, I actually spared you from this a few weeks ago to uh, pursue some other material and noted it at the time, and I've kind of folded that into the session, into this section. And, and this is highly testable material, I might add, so, so you should take note of it. So if we have a function from, from x to y, maybe it's from um, reals to reals, you know, it's squaring a number, for example, um, or, or taking a square root. Um, uh, we, um, we will often um, be interested in whether or not that function is a particular member of a particularly simple and particularly in many ways nice subset of, of, of functions that are termed linear functions. Uh, linear functions uh, offer uh, particularly attraction because, because of their simplicity. The fact that they are um, uh, simple affords us the opportunity to take advantage of many simplifications um, and uh, allows us to to put aside a lot of um, more complex worries that come into place with nonlinear functions. Um, and ultimately, things that are nonlinear will often appear linear as we kind of zoom into them. Um, and so it's not that, uh, that linear functions are just some strange subset of, of uh, arbitrary subset of functions. Um, I've heard some analogize them uh, in an unfriendly way to the elephants of the animal kingdom, for example. But it's not really like that at all. They're, they're a particularly um, uh, important set because they approximate other functions when you really uh, zoom into to those other functions. Um, they're an important building block, as it were. And in general, we call such a function from x to y, maybe it's reals to ints, or maybe it's uh, as computer scientists, maybe it's uh, uh, reals to Booleans, for example. We call it linear um, uh, if, if we have some nice properties associated with it. Um, and while I won't go into how these generalize to other data types, um, let's consider for simplicity a function from real to reals, for example. Um, if we have uh, f of a of a plus b, the quantity a plus b, the question is, is it equal to f of a plus f of b? Um, and uh, equally going along with that, we could ask if we uh, take the function, we apply it to, to a scaling of a given value. Let's say alpha times some value x, is it just equal to alpha times x, okay? Um, 
this is these are properties uh, associated with linear functions. If these hold, if um, when we consider the sum of two numbers, if that's uh, if apply the function to that, if that gives the same as applying as taking the sum of the function applied to each of those uh, two numbers, then we're uh, then we're, we're associated with a linear function. So consider the function, for example, that doubles numbers at f of x equals 2x. It takes a number in and it doubles it. So if you give it a 3, it gives you a 6. If you give it a 5, it gives you a 10, right? Um, and the question here, is it linear? Um, and uh, with a bit, of, um, a bit of thinking, you should be able to satisfy yourself that it is. Um, so uh, if we apply the first criteria, if we have f of a plus b, um, well, we know that from the definition, this is just 2 times a plus b, which is 2a plus 2b, um, just by the distributive law that you learned in grade school. And uh, you know that's equal to f of a plus f of b. Um, so this equals uh, this. Applying the function to the sum of two things is just the sum of applying that function to each of those things in isolation. Uh, and what this is showing is that linear functions are, are nice because they allow us to take a complex thing, like a sum of two things, and break it down into, into a set of pieces that we know what to deal with. In this case, we divide it up into A and B, the things being added, and just apply the function to them. It allows this kind of divide and conquer that's very near and dear to us as computer scientists, uh, whether it's through quicksort or merge sort or many other algorithms. You know, we, we work by dividing and conquering in, in computer science. By contrast, there's a set of these functions which are, are nonlinear and, and uh, those constitute most functions out there. Um, so for example, we might have squaring and you know, this is, should be very, familiar to you as a function, perhaps it's one you, 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 you feel just as comfortable with as, as two times x, but um, whoa, it's, it's not linear. Uh, so if you, if you think about it, f of a plus b is the square of, of a plus b quantity. And, and that's equal to this god awful thing, right? Um, and that's not equal to just applying f to a and then adding it to f applied to B. It's definitely not the case. I mean, this one has all these components, but it also has this tangled component. That's where, you know, A and B become tangled together, which is not present when you just take this and take this apart. So this is an example of a nonlinear function. We can't just take apart, we can't just piece apart our our problem and say, well, we'll divide and conquer into A and B. And once we've applied F to each of those, we're done. No, it's not like that at all. We, um, we need to actually consider A and B's tangling together. And that's one of the general characteristics of nonlinear functions. And, and the same thing holds, uh, by the way, with, with applying this other criteria, okay? Um, now, you may be wondering, well, that's all nice and good for things like 2X or X squared, but in this class, we're dealing with dynamical systems. We're dealing with systems whose uh, behavior, whose change over time depends on the current state of that system. Um, so we might have a system S, I, and R, and we count the number of people in the susceptible state, the infected state, and the recovered state. And that evolves over time. And how the system changes, whether anyone gets infected or not, for example, depends on the value of S, I, and R. Um, those are characteristics of dynamical systems in general. And, um, and in these uh, contexts, we're dealing not of functions of just some inputs A and B, we're, we're dealing with a function of, of the state of the system. And to, to start us out kind of as training wheels, as it were, um, on, uh, we're, we're going to be labeling system state with a little arrow over it, just to remind you that it's a vector, okay? Um, it's a vector of, of quantities. And, and maybe it's, you know, X, Y, Z, for example. Um, uh, maybe it's uh, just S, I, S and I. Um, maybe by contrast, it's a whole big series of state variables like we use in our COVID modeling. Uh, so 
In any case, the, the function that we're interested in here is the function that characterizes for, for ODEs um, how the, the system evolves based on the current state. And how the system evolves um, is dictated by what its rate of change is, right? So we have uh, ds dt or s dot, di dt i dot, and dr dt r dot. How quickly is s rising? How quickly is i rising? How quickly is uh, r rising? Reflecting the fact that it could be negative, in which case they're going down, right? So that's what we have when we have these, these um, systems of, of equations associated with a system dynamics model. Um, and um, over here on the right-hand side will be inflow minus outflow for a given one of, of X and Y and Z, okay? Um, so when we're dealing with these things, um, this, the same terminology which we used earlier carries over. So we say it's a, it's a linear dynamical system. If, um, if you consider a, a given state um, and if it's a sum of two states, let's say a state A and a state B, S sub A, S sub B. If that's equal to, if, if our function over here on the right applied to that is just equal to F of A plus F of B, then this is a, a linear system. Um, and uh, that will afford us enormous opportunities. And in, in particular, we can solve it in closed form. In other words, we can write down a formula for it um, when we have a linear system. Um, now, there are many linear systems and we'll see them later. Um, first order delays are a linear system. Um, uh, second order delays, third order delays, nth order delays, all these are linear systems. Um, that target follower example that we went through where you had perception and delayed perception. That's all, um, those are all linear systems. Um, by contrast, uh, if we have a nonlinear system, like an SIR model, an infectious disease model, uh, this isn't nearly the case, right? Because if we consider, let's consider a state which consists of uh, a state of some infectives together with a state of some susceptibles. So S sub A maybe has all the infectives and S sub B has all the susceptibles. Um, if we put them all together in, a, in, a, in, in one pot, as it were, um, and stir, um, bad things are gonna happen, like susceptibles to be infected by infectives. Uh, by contrast, if we consider how that system will behave if we only add the infectives, we'd have no concerns because there's no way to infect. And so nobody's gonna get infected. They're all gonna just go on and recover and that's it, boom. Um, by contrast, if we have all the, well, in addition, if we had all the susceptibles and we put them in their own isolated room, which you're probably feeling like you're in right now, um, then uh, nobody's gonna get infected either. And the sum of those is gonna give us something very different than putting them all in and stirring, right, together, uh, where there's going to be infection. So this doesn't work so well for, for um, uh, nonlinear uh, non models, it breaks down. And, and infectious disease models are kind of the preeminent example of a nonlinear model um, in terms of uh, degree of use. Uh, they're also used uh, extensively as well. Um, okay, um, you know, I have some uh, other comments here, but what I will say is for anyone here who's from engineering background, in engineering, um, one learns a whole canon of techniques by which you can analyze system behavior for a certain subclass of systems. They are dynamical systems. They're systems which evolve over time, but they're, they're what are called linear time invariant systems. And they're not only linear, they're they also not to vary by time. And it turns out there, you can do wonderfully beautiful things. You can, um, to reason about how a system would behave um, uh, with respect to some inputs, um, you can just understand how it will behave with respect to exponentials, um, things like sinusoids um, or, or damped versions of them. And, and it turns out that it'll respond with exactly the same exponential, the same frequency, for example, of sinusoid. It will just be damped or, or, or expanded, um, or it will uh, decay over time, et cetera. 
And once again, here, the whole is just the sum of the parts um, for these linear systems. But when we have nonlinear systems, we're dealing with a different beast. Okay, now I need you, we're gonna be diving into some of the mathematics. I've sort of set the groundwork here. And now we're gonna get into some of the particular mathematics. Um, so, and this is where some intuition building is called for. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if we have a vector X and we have a matrix A, and I'll hew to this convention of denoting with capital letters, uh, matrices and lowercase letters, um, uh, vectors, okay? Um, uh, and I'm dropping the little arrow over it, although you'll see it revived at a few places, um, but this is a vector. Um, so a vector, if you have a, a matrix times uh, a compatible vector, the vector has to have as many elements in it as are columns in the matrix as it's multiplied on the right, then you can think of X as kind of representing the weights. It, it kind of tells how much of each column of A we want. Uh, think of it as a takeout order. We're saying we want this amount of the first column, this amount of the second column of A, this amount of the third column of A, this amount of the fourth column of A. That's what kind of X gives you. And, and A times X will say, yes, ma'am. And it will sum all those things up into a single response, okay? That's, that's what you could think of a matrix times a vector in, in this form giving you. It, it kind of is, is a weighted sum uh, of the, um, of the uh, columns of A. Um, and uh, equally much so, um, you could think of us as, as kind of uh, uh, saying, uh, how much of each column do we want? Um, and it will give you something. Or alternatively, if this is, um, if we consider y equals x, that's what that, that is. It tells um, what, what is the result of ordering each of those columns of A uh, according to x. Uh, alternatively, if A is invertible and we multiply in the left here, what we can see is that um, here, if we have the matrix uh, inverse times y, it basically tells us, it gives us a vector that tells us how much of each of those columns of A is in Y. It kind of decomposes Y into say, there's this much of column one, there's that much of column two, there's that much of column three, that's what's in each element of X, okay? So when we have, when we have matrix multiplication, it's it's important for intuitions that you don't just view it as boxes and weird shaped columns of numbers. It's th there's an intuition here. There's a geometry here, and there's um, operations here being performed. And in this case, we're kind of decomposing Y to figure out how much of each column of A is in it. And in this case, we're kind of um, telling how much of each column of A we want to give us Y, okay? Um, I want you to keep these intuitions in mind that like applying the inverse of a matrix to a vector um, sort of tells us it decomposes that vector into the columns of, of, of A. We're gonna, we're gonna need that intuition in a few minutes. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a dynamical system here, okay? And we're gonna talk here about considering that dynamical system um, uh, around a, a certain point, uh, which I'll call S question mark, okay? Um, that's, that's a certain point. We wanna sort of consider that, that system around as it behaves at a certain state. After all, these systems have different behavior at different states, even linear systems, right? Uh, um, if we have nobody, if the first order delay is nothing in the stock, nothing's gonna come out. If it has lots of people in the stock, all sorts of things will be coming out. The flow out will be large. So in general for dynamical systems, how it behaves depends on its state. And we're gonna consider its state at S question mark, okay? Um, and we're gonna have this uh, notation here. I'm gonna be asking how quickly is S changing around, uh, uh, around S, and actually this should be S question mark, but um, 
uh, and that's just going to be given by, well, uh, if, we, oh, sorry, if we consider it around an arbitrary point S that's close to S question mark, that's so S, S with a little uh, arrow over it is indicating sort of a state that's around the vicinity of S question mark. Well, basically how the system will behave there is given by F at S question mark plus some correction factor, some factor that kind of tells us, um, uh, it considers how far off we are from S question mark and, um, and have some correction based on that. Um, and here the correction is a, is a linear one, um, but includes some uh, higher order terms in general. Now, these higher order terms, uh, I, I denote HOT by convention, um, and these are nonlinear terms, okay? Uh, these are terms that, that involve sort of squaring of, of things, and um, I had a, a better indication of it later. I, I somehow, I, I missed it here. But basically, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a function that involves squares, involves multiplication of multiple terms. And um, these higher order terms will be things that for a linear function disappear. There's none of them. All we have is this linear term. So if we consider the behavior of the system around an, a point S that's in the vicinity of S question mark, it's basically the behavior at S question mark plus some some correction term plus some higher order terms, which were, if we're close to S question mark, will be very, very small. Now, um, this correction term is linear. It involves a matrix times a vector, which you heard about in linear algebra. Um, it's basically some linear for any given row of this, it's some number times this, this difference. And it's just summing up the, the, each of these items uh, as uh, compared to um, as multiplied by each of the items here. Um, so these are a vector uh, that tells us how far off we are in X, how far off we are in Y, how far off we are in Z. And we're multiplying by the rate of how quickly S is changing in its X coordinate by X, how quickly it's changing if we, if we uh, alter Y and how quickly it changes if we alter Z. Uh, these are what I call partial derivatives, which, which basically say how quickly is, is the, the, in this case, F sub X is the first element of F uh, here. Um, how quickly is it changing if we change the X coordinate? This is how quickly is it changing if we're changing the y coordinate? How quickly is it changing if we're changing the z coordinate? Now, for linear terms, this is going whoa, this is going to go away, and we'll get this, and basically we end up getting this nice uh, formula, which which says that for a linear system, all you you're dealing with in terms of system behavior is some matrix times this vector s. So if you want to understand how it operates on some vector, arbitrary vector X, all you have to do is multiply X by a uh, S by a matrix and, and you've got uh, how it operates. This m multiplication of this vector of this matrix by this vector, remember is just the sum of each of these columns, which tells um, how it changes, how each state variable S, I, R changes with respect to to here X, Y, and Z, for example, or S, I, R, uh, elements of S. Um, and in each of these columns is basically going to be saying how quickly is, um, is this thing changing as you change X, how quickly is it changing as you change Y and as you change uh, Z. So if you think about, for example, S, maybe it's composed of S, I, R, or let's say here, because they're labeled as such, X, Y, Z, okay? If we have X, remember, if X, if S is a vector, X, Y, Z, this first, this first column of this matrix will be multiplied by X, right? It's gonna be multiplied by X. And that's going to be telling us, okay, how quickly, is S, S changing, in other words, how much of S dot 
comes from considering uh, X here. Um, and, and this is going to need to be considered across, since we're considering S dot, that's S dot, uh, sorry, uh, S, this S, it's capital S dot, uh, uh, lowercase or capital I dot and capital R dot, or here X dot, Y dot, Z dot, okay? Since I've labeled it X, Y, Z. So S dot here will consist of a vector X, X dot, Y dot, Z dot, um, telling how quickly we're changing X, how quickly we're changing Y, how quickly we're changing Z. And that's what each of these components is telling us. We're saying how much is, for example, uh, X changing? Um, how much uh, uh, change are we making in X as we change the, for X dot, as we change uh, X and, and S here? How quickly are we changing Y dot as we change X here? How quickly are we changing Z dot as we change X here? And the next column is going to be saying the same things. How quickly are we changing S dot as we change Y here? How quickly are we changing I dot as we change Y here? How quickly are we changing Z dot as we change Y? Um, and same thing for this last column. How quickly we're we changing S dot as we change Z. How quickly are we changing S dot or I dot as we change Z. How quickly are we changing R dot as we change Z. So that's what each of these uh, columns is going to be giving us. Multiplying them, uh, what we're going to be getting is a sum up of those columns. Um, it's the first column times the X component of S the second column times the Y component of X, the third column times the Z component of X, which is what, what we basically said here, okay? And summing those up is gonna give us the totality of S dot. Um, so that's what this matrix times S is doing. It's, it's basically taking into account all the changes from S as they occurred through the X component of S, through the Y component of X, and through the Z component of S. And this matrix is, is providing that, uh, that uh, to us, okay? So this matrix is summarizing how F changes with respect to S in the form of a matrix. And we can do so because we're dealing with a linear function. And that's why we get linear algebra. So for a linear function f, this f of s just reduces to s times some matrix, times a bunch of numbers that summarize how, how f changes with respect to each component of x, x, y, z. And that's gonna give us s dot. Okay, um, now um, I wanna further remind you of another factoid from linear algebra, which we're going to need. This intuition we're going to need, but there's another factoid too. Let's consider some, let's consider we have some vectors. I'm gonna call them X1, X2, X3. And if I were really careful, I would put in little arrows over them. Um, but each of those vectors is gonna look something like this, okay? I'm gonna call X sub I, the first element of it I'll call X sub I comma one, and the second X sub I comma two. And it will go all the way down to X sub M, okay? Um, so each of these is a vector. It's a vector that looks like this. It has M elements. Uh, and oh, um, I performed a boo-boo. This should have been one, it should have been one comma I, two comma I, M comma I. I changed my notation at some point here, okay. So if we put all those vectors into a matrix, these are just vectors, right? They each look like this. We could put them into a matrix, just they're columns of this matrix. Um, they constitute columns of X, okay? Um, now, if we have another matrix that's compatible dimension, this is M by N, um, M rows, N columns. If we have a different matrix, that is L rows in M columns. Um, and we consider A times this matrix X. So X is some other matrix of a somewhat different but compatible shape. And we multiply it by X. 
then it turns out that what we get by multiplying this is nothing more than a matrix formed by multiplying A by the first column, multiplying A by the second column. That's the second column of AX. And the nth column of AX is going to be A times the last column here, okay? Um, that's, that's what we get. So this matrix X is composed of these columns, which I've named X1 through Xn. And multiplying A times X, A times this matrix, will give us a matrix, each of whose columns will be given by A, the thing we're multiplying by, times the corresponding column of X, okay? So, so that's just kind of a factoid. AX is a vector, so it's, it's some vector. And that's what the first column will be is AX1. It's some vector determined by multiplying this, this matrix A, which I'm not showing, but it's of size L times M times X1. Et cetera. So this is some, some matrix of columns given by each of these. But the important thing is that each of these relates to the columns of X. Like this first column of AX is just the first column of X times A. So the second column of AX is just the second column of A of, of X times times A, A being in front. So so this is a factoid that we're going to rely on uh, next. Okay, so this is like a, a tour. I don't know if it's a happy tour or a tour, ladies and gentlemen, of misery and horror through linear algebra, um, but I'm hoping it's more the, um, uh, the former. Um, so um, in this happy tour, um, I want to remind you of a construct um, that you may have longed to forget, but it's a beautiful construct. And, and it deserves a, a more fitting place in your memory. Um, it's called an eigenvector. They're called eigenvectors and eigenvalues, okay? So we're gonna focus here on matrices that are square, okay? Um, we're gonna love square matrices because a very important matrix is square here, the Jacobian. Um, it's, uh, it's gonna have, if we have a, SIR system, it's going to be three by three because we have S, I, and R. Those are our three, and we're going to need a three by three matrix. Um, uh, and the rows are going to reflect the derivatives of, of S, of I, and R, and the columns will represent S, I, and R uh, uh, accordingly, how much it changes as, with respect to a change in S, a change in I, and a change in R. Okay. Um, so let's consider that square matrix A. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, now you may recall from the dim recesses of your memory um, that, that when we have a square matrix, in general, we have these things called eigenvectors, okay? And eigenvectors um, are the, the kind of natural vectors of, of A. It's A's own vectors, hence eigen. Um, in German. So uh, each eigenvector, it's this very special property, this lovely property. If we multiply A times the eigenvector, I don't know what this S is. Come on, um, get with the program, Osgood. Okay, there we go. Um, A times this eigenvector. If we multiply A times that eigenvector, we get back the same eigenvector. It's just scaled. So we, it's kind of like um, the, it's, it's kind of, it just passes through A. A is like this, this, this operator that applies to it. And we, when we give it that as input, it gives the same thing as output. It's just scaled by some term uh, lambda sub I. And, and really I should have labeled that. Okay, okay, now I'm really in trouble. Um, I should have labeled that with a uh, equal um, you know, equal subscript. So if we have an eigenvector of A, A times that eigenvector will give us that eigenvector back, um, but it will be multiplied by constant. It will just be shrunk or be enlarged. So A acting on this eigenvector will, um, give us the same thing back, it just grows it or shrinks it. 
Um, now that's a lovely property. It's absolutely delightful because it kind of means that that these eigenvectors are kind of the natural, um, they form a natural coordinate system with A. A doesn't, A doesn't do weird things to them. It doesn't, it doesn't twist them in some strange way. It doesn't tangle their elements in some nasty way. All it does is kind of grow them or shrink them. Um, and, and so it leaves them largely untouched. Um, and so it's a very natural uh, coordinate system. Uh, if we describe things in terms of vectors E, it's, it's nice because we know how A acts on each of those by squeezing or, or uh, enlarging them. And in fact, we love these so much, we like putting them together into matrices. So we're gonna create a matrix S that's, gonna, that's going to con be constituted by each of those eigenvectors, okay? Now you may say, what the hell? I mean, that's, that's, that's a weird idea, but remember it's just what we did here, right? I had these vectors X sub one through X sub N and we put them as the columns of a matrix, right? And you could say, well, that's a weird thing. Well, it won't be so weird. Um, won't be so weird once you consider it together with this property. So we're gonna have a matrix of these eigenvectors, okay? Um, here we go, E1, E2, E3 through EF. Okay, um, now if we have that by the same property as here, if we multiply S times A up front, um, we're gonna get AE1, AE2, AEN, right? Um, we're just multiplying A times each of these vectors. I, I said it here, right? Um, uh, if you have a matrix X that's composed of these vectors, you multiply A by it, all you're gonna get is matrix out. That's this matrix A times each of those vectors. So, so this is what we're gonna get out. If we multiply A times this special matrix consisting of eigenvectors, this is what we get out. But that's very nice thing because each of these we know for any eigenvector, any of these columns, we know A times it is just that same eigenvector scaled. Whoa, whoa, okay, it's, it's just scaled by lambda. That's all it is. So each of these columns is just, it's the same thing. It's just grown. It's just, you know, uh, maybe lambda is, is two. And so it's, it's, it's enlarged uh, this vector um, that we passed in or, or it's a smaller version, it's just multiplied by some constant. So AS is just equal to lambda S. Um, and we write that in, in matrix notation in the following form. Um, we, uh, we can write it more tersely as this. It's just S uh, times, times uh, uh, a matrix of these eigenvalues, uh, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. That may look strange to you, but uh, if, you, if you think about it, how matrix multiplication works, this um, lambda one will be multiplied by the first column of S, right? Um, uh, lambda two will be multiplied by the second column of S uh, when you multiply by this matrix. That's, that's how matrix multiplication will work. Um, and, uh, and so this whole thing is just lambda one. It's just, it's exactly what's shown over here. It's a, it's a matrix whose first column is just lambda one times E1 whose second column is lambda two times C two, et cetera. Okay, and that's just equal to, uh, we'll write it in this kind of uh, style of which mathematicians uh, are rather fond of S times some matrix of, of eigenvalues called uh, capital lambda. And all it is is it's zero except on the diagonal where it's each of the eigenvalues, okay? Um, now, this may strike you as, you know, kind of an interesting fact. Uh, thank you very much for telling me that. Uh, it may not seem like something that's just likely to revolutionize your life, uh, but um, it, it's, it has profound consequences. And one of them is, if you look what's going on here, I, I started this whole thing off by saying AS equals this thing, and we unpacked it into this thing. Um, where capital lambda is just this matrix. 
but since we know that, um, uh, as long as this, these eigenvalues are, are um, invertible, this eigenvalue matrix is invertible, which is true for many, many systems, um, we know AS equals S, S lambda from this, and that's what this equals that. And we can then use this to express what's called the diagonalization of A. So if we just multiply by, uh, by uh, S inverse on the left of this AS, we'll get A times S times S inverse, which is just A, because the S and the S inverse cancel. And we'll get that equals to S times capital lambda times S inverse, which is shown right down here. Um, and, and conversely, we can arrive at what capital lambda matrix is, what the eigenvalues are is just multiplying S inverse times A times S. Now, this may strike you as a weird looking thing. Maybe it has a certain beautiful symmetry um, Hopefully not a fearful symmetry, but it's it may not it, it may not appeal greatly to you. Uh, but it's actually a rather beautiful thing. Um, so let's consider multiplying a. So harking back to this, um, and I wish there were some way to move that little thing that widget. Um, it's it's a horrendous um, barrier, but. Um, if we have A equals uh, S times uh, capital lambda times S, S inverse, where the capital lambda is the matrix of eigenvalues. Um, uh, if we multiply A times some vector V, that's the same as multiplying this thing on the right, S times uh, capital lambda times uh, S inverse times V, right? Um, it's the same thing, A equals S capital M to S inverse. And so multiplying A times V is the same as multiplying this. And what this is actually saying is, uh, if you have a vector, S inverse times it is basically taking it apart into each of the eigenvectors, okay? Um, that's what S, remember S contains eigenvectors. That's, that's what it does, it, it contains eigenvectors. It's a matrix of eigenvectors. And remember what I said earlier that, and where was it here? that um, when you multiply some inverse of a matrix times some vector, it gives you how much of each of the columns of the matrix are in Y. That's what, what this does. That's what X gives you out. It's how much of each of the columns of A is there in Y. And that's what's going on here um, is we're, we're saying how much of each of the eigenvectors is in V. Mm. Mm. Um, it's, it's decomposing V into each of these pieces. It's, it's sort of parceling out, okay, V has so much of the first eigenvector, so much of the second eigenvector, so much of the third eigenvector. Um, now, if we wanna understand this expression, then if we multiply lambda times it, it's basically saying, okay, how much do we have to scale that um, that eigenvector, because remember when that eigenvector gets multiplied, uh, sorry, when the when A gets multiplied by some eigenvector, um, it, or sorry, when A is multiplied, uh, yeah, when we have A times S, uh, S is composed of the eigenvectors. And in order to figure out the operation here, basically we're going to be asking, uh, okay, um, how much uh, do we have to scale each of those eigenvectors uh, accordingly? S is the eigenvectors of A, consists of the eigenvectors of A. So if we're multiplying S by something um, that, that is composed of a bunch of, has so much of one eigenvector, so much of the second eigenvector, so much of the third, um, then we know that it's operation on each of those things is just going to scale each of those according to the eigenvector, uh, um, the eigenvalue. So that's what's going on here. Uh, S inverse times V is gonna tell us how much of the first eigenvector is in V, and we're gonna be scaling that by the first eigenvalue because that's what it does when you multiply A times the first eigenvector. 
it scales it by the first eigenvalue. Um, you can see it up here. And similarly, for the second eigenvalue, the second eigenvector, we're figuring out how much of that is in V, and we're scaling uh, that by the second eigenvalue, because when we multiply by A, that's what, what it does when it applies to an eigenvector. And we'll figure out how much the third eigenvector is in there. And we know when A acts on that third eigenvector, it'll just scale it by the third eigenvalue. And so that's what this, this expression is doing. And then all the S's up front is transforming back into the normal basis. Um, so basically the action of A is simulated by this action of, of this. All we're doing is we're taking B temporarily into this eigenvector domain. We're sort of transforming into this new coordinate system where we know exactly how A operates because it operates just in the scaling way with eigenvalues. And we are then going to, when we're done, we're going back to the normal domain. Okay, so, so A's action in the normal domain is mirrored by the action of, of lambda, capital lambda in the, in the eigenbasis in this alternative representation. Um, I'm throwing some things out there for those of you who are interested in going a bit deeper. That isn't absolutely required, but it's a nice intuition to have. Okay, now back to our, our, our main uh, focus here. Um, uh, we're going to be, um, so we noted earlier that when we have a linear system that uh, we can characterize that linear system's actions on a, given, on a given vector. In other words, we could say, how is it going to change with that vector by multiplying a matrix times that vector? And the matrix had this kind of weird form that said, how much does each component of S, S dot, for example, change with each, so this is the first row, with each successive element of S. So how much does it change with respect to X? How much does it change with respect to Y? How much does it change with respect to Z? That is how much does uh, X dot change or how much does Y dot change for this next row with respect to S, I and uh, change in S, I and R and how much does Z dot change? That's what each of these does. And this matrix has a very special name. And it's a name that enshrines the name of a mathematician, uh, Jacobi. Uh, it's called the Jacobian, okay? Um, and this is the Jacobian matrix and we'll write it as, as J, okay? Um, and um, it turns out that this whole thing with eigenbases in this alternative coordinate system will be really a, a useful thing once you start understanding how these dynamical systems behave around equilibria. Um, Okay, so the Jacobian matrix looks like this, okay? Now, um, it turns out that um, this, this Jacobian matrix, if we have it, if we have system behavior described by this, um, then we can actually reason fruitfully about the decomposition of this. We could take J apart into a diagonal matrix, okay? now. It may seem like a, a weird thing to do, but it, it ends up being really, really useful to do this because this is its kind of natural, um, the, the eigenvectors describe its natural ways of operating. How, how J behaves is entirely dictated by how it behaves in these eigenvectors. And they're a particularly sort of natural way of describing its behavior, a, a particularly sort of simple way of its describing its behavior. Um, and through diagonalization of J by describing its equivalent in some eigen space, some, some alternative coordinate system, um, we, can, um, we can understand uh, that behavior uh, more deeply. And one of the things that um, you'll, you'll end up learning if, if you were to go a bit deeper is that if we have a system described like this, S dot, equals JS, where S is some vector. Maybe it's SIR here, and let's call it XYZ without loss of generality. How the system is behaving for each of those, X dot, for Y dot, for Z dot, 
um, is given by the action of, of this matrix on S. So S dot is given maybe by three X plus two Y minus three Z, three Z, okay? Um, and, and similarly, we could do it for I dot and, and Z dot. Now, it turns out that if we have this phrased in this way, um, we can find a solution to it. It turns out this, and, and those of you who have uh, been exposed to differential equations course may recognize this as something that can be uh, easily solved. Um, some even might remember it from something like 116 if you've taken that course. Um, but basically there's a solution to this uh, which falls out. Um, and uh, it's that S over time, the evolution of S is given by an exponential of alpha plus J, JT. Now imagine this is alpha, okay? Imagine, uh, ima sorry, uh, let's call it beta because I used alpha there. Let's call it beta. It's some constant, some constant beta, okay? S dot equals beta S. If that were some constant, um, you might recognize this as uh, being given by S dot equals beta S is solved by E to the beta T. Um, so that's the solution to this equation. Uh, and the same thing holds even if this is a whole matrix. So it turns out that there's a solution to this matrix like this. Now, um, um, so we're getting some audio interference here. Um, so uh, it, it turns out that you can expand this by knowing what J is, you can expand it into pieces and this relies on this Taylor series expansion. You can end up uh, expanding this out and what you'll get is that the system evolves according to this formula, S times E to the lambda T uh, times S inverse. And it turns out E to the lambda T is, is just this, this thing here. Um, now this may not seem like uh, a particularly delightful uh, piece of learning, but what this is saying is for a linear system, if we have this, um, all we have to know is um, how the system will behave with respect to each of the eigenmodes of this, each of the eigen uh, values and eigenvectors of this. And then all we have to do is take S apart into eigenvectors we know how it responds to each of those. We can say how the system will respond, and then we can convert it back to the normal um, to the normal coordinate system. Um, so uh, that's exactly what this is is doing. So each of these, when we have a linear system, all we have to do is figure out how it responds to each of the so-called eigenmodes, the the eigenvectors of this Jacobian matrix, and we'll end up knowing how it will behave in general because those modes don't interact. There's no interaction among them for a linear system. They're solitudes. They just evolve according to the eigenvalues. And they evolve, in fact, according to the um, exponentials of the eigenvalues. So if alpha, if, if lambda x is less than zero, uh, e to the lambda x will be, uh, it'll be like minus, you know, 2t. It'll be, it'll be getting smaller and smaller. If lambda is uh, equal to two, it'll be getting bigger and bigger over time. It'll grow exponentially. And each of these eigenmodes behave separately. They, they behave as solitudes. They behave independently of each other. And so all we have to do in linear systems is take the system apart, take our vector here apart into these, to these eigen, eigenmodes into these kind of uh, components of this for each eigenvector of this matrix J. And we know how it will respond. It will respond according to these things. And some will grow, some will be damped out, some will circle around because of complex values they won't get into. And, but basically we know how it will respond, okay? Um, and uh, this is why for an, anyone with engineering background, uh, you, you end up uh, for these linear time invariant systems composing things into sinusoids because those are just another form of these exponentials. 
Um, so when we have a linear system, when we have a system that um, is like the many we've looked at that are linear, um, it'll behave uh, very nicely. This is why uh, if you've been in a bus going over potholes, it shakes up and down in kind of a sinusoidal way. This is why if you have a rubber band and you stretch it, it becomes harder and harder to stretch and it'll pull back harder and harder. Um, but our interest here will be in taking this further to nonlinear modes where that rubber band breaks apart and no longer uh, exerts the force back. But first, let's take a look at these linear systems. So here are two linear systems we saw. This is a second order delay. Um, and this is, a, um, this is a target follower uh, up here. So let's take a look at the, the first order delay, okay? Um, so with a first order, uh, sorry, second order delay, we have X and Y here, okay? Um, now there's one um, equilibrium, which is zero, zero. The system is only gonna be, hmm, um, so since this had an inflow, I should have taken that into account. The inflow was 10. So this is actually going to have a, an equilibrium where inflow equals outflow for X. So, so we're gonna uh, be such that um, uh, X has equal inflow and outflow. Um, so X is going to equal to the mean time in X uh, times, uh, times the, the inflow. And uh, where the Y uh, is going to have a, 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 an equilibrium as well. If in this case, the Jacobian matrix, this, this thing here is just gonna be of this form. Okay, um, uh, the Jacobian matrix is going to uh, reflect the fact that we're taking dx dt. Um, we're asking how quickly is that changing with respect to x? Essentially, we take the derivative of this with respect to x, and that's going to be minus one because it's minus x of t, hence the minus one. Um, we're going to ask. How quickly is it changing with respect to y? Well, it's not. There's no y term, or there's zero times y, so that gives the zero here. Here, uh, we're going to be asking how quickly is y of t's change occurring with respect to x? So we're going to take the derivative of this with respect to x, and that will give us this one, which goes there, and then with respect to y, it gives us the minus 0.5. So this is the Jacobian matrix from this thing. The Jacobian matrix will tell us how quickly X and Y are changing in any other state variables with respect to a little change in X, a little change in Y, a little change in Z, each of the state variables. Okay, so that's what the Jacobian matrix is giving us. This is the state space associated with it, how it's evolving over time. And the equilibrium is where it's going in the, in the lower left of that blue curve. And this is its behavior over time from a, for a given initial state. So Cobian is here, the, the eigenvalues are here. And what these eigenvalues are is um, they are all negative. And it turns out that uh, the eigenvalues in this matrix are going to dictate the stability. If all the eigenvalues uh, within this are negative, the system will be stable. It'll be resilient. It'll be pulling back towards some equilibrium. If it's disturbed, that disturbance will be damped and it will pull back. By contrast, if any of these uh, lambdas are greater than zero, the real part of it is greater than zero, it is going to be uh, unstable. It will fly apart. It's like um, you know a person coming in with a novel infection to the airport, and it's likely to to not be resilient. So COVID nineteen in Saskatoon early on uh, at very first was not resilient. It had an eigenvalue greater than zero, the real part of the eigenvalue, and then through public health measures we reduced it so it was stable. We turned them all negative. And so it brought down the number of cases until um, reopening um, started and uh, it took off again. So uh, here um, we have the, the eigenvalues uh, associated with it. These are eigenvectors. And, um, 
and what this is indicating is it's stable. It's going towards some stable point. If we knocked it off, if we so-called perturbed it from here, it would come right back. Um, it would be robust, resilient. Here's our target follower. If we examine that, um, we get a Jacobian matrix here. Uh, this gives the minus one for y. There's no x term here, hence it's zero. There's an x term here with a positive one and, and a minus one. So that's the Jacobian matrix here. This is its state space associated with it. It has uh, an equilibrium value, and I said zero, but I, I should have anticipated the target here. So that actually needs to be modified for the target. I'll do it and repost the slides. But the interesting thing is the eigenvalues here have a negative real component. So it's, it's stable. It's going towards some stable equilibrium. But um, it also has this, this imaginary component. So this is a complex number. Uh, engineers would often write this with J. Um, uh, conventions differ, but this is I is the square root of minus one. Uh, and what this term indicates is there's a cyclic component. There's an oscillatory component. So it's cycling around this, but it's damped because the, the real part is negative. So it's getting sucked into this vortex. It's getting sucked in and spiraling around. Um, Soon enough in the class and building on this lecture, you'll have a problem given to you, which, um, uh, which involves something which is entirely cyclic, a population which oscillates in cycles characteristic uh, of natural populations and indeed characteristics of things like sleep-wake cycles in our body. Uh, there will be purely imaginary. There'll be no negative or positive real component. It's not approaching some, some equilibrium. It's just spiraling around it. We might call it informally a dynamic equilibrium. Um, so here, the structure of these eigenvalues will tell whether it's stable. They're all negative. Unstable. So, or I should say the real part is, is of, each, of each and every one is negative. They're unstable. The real part of at least one is greater than, a, uh, greater than zero. Or you can have these situations where they're kind of cyclically stable and, and it's purely imaginary. Um, so this is, these are all linear systems. But the challenge is, ladies and gentlemen, nonlinear systems. Um, with a linear system, we can't express the system using one Jacobian because the Jacobian will vary based on where you are in state space. Um, the Jacobian will be different uh, depending on the current value, for example, of S, I, and R. Uh, the Jacobian is going to vary um, uh, over the values of system state. Um, and we can't decouple it in this way. There's not one set of eigenvectors that characterizes the whole system. Um, and and this, this is a reflection of the fact that nonlinear systems are in general tangled. They're gnarly to deal with. Some people might call them nasty, although I think that's an overly strong term. They're, uh, they're wicked sometimes in the sense that often they're associated with, with uh, real challenges that are cross-sectoral in nature. Um, that involve uh, not one area of a broader system, but many areas. Um, and you know, in areas like uh, uh, societal concerns involving health, um, you know, with these nonlinear systems, you get things uh, that cross over areas. You know, you get things like with um, with domestic violence, for example, which is a health issue, but it's also a uh, an issue with criminal justice and and issues of corrections and issues of social services. You get things like drug addiction uh, and substance uh, challenges, which are yes, health. They're criminal justice and corrections where they policing related, and they are also related to social services. Um, um, they tangle things apart in ways that that defy easy cutting it into pieces and just dealing with it in a siloed way. And ladies and gentlemen, your generation is, is shackled with, unfortunately, a growing number of these problems. 
whether associated with ecosystem degradation, which is at once a problem of economic development, a problem of, at the environmental side, a problem in terms of sustainability of agriculture, sustainability of livelihoods, and health. Um, it's after all, this, you know, issues of, of deforestation and ecosystem fragmentation that have brought COVID to our shores. Um, these nonlinear systems uh, require these sort of, uh, these computational methods to address them. Um, with nonlinear systems, we can't reason about the behavior of a whole by summing up its behavior with respect to each of the pieces. The Jacobian is going to vary over different areas of the system state, and the natural coordinate systems will vary. Um, uh, but as we'll see, um, it doesn't mean that the system has no structure. It just may have a complex structure, as we see with chaotic systems, which have a lot of orderliness. It just looks random if you look at it with a naive lens. But if you can perceive that orderliness, if you have the right lenses to perceive it, you might be able to manage that system in a much more uh, sensible way, a much more robust way. Um, so with nonlinear systems, you know, the behavior of a system is going to depend nonlinearly on, on system state. Um, here we're going to have, you know, a chance of being infected is going to depend not just on how many people are at risk of being infected, the susceptibles, but how many other people are currently infected, right? Um, and so on for, for other examples. So when we have these systems, um, we're going to have this, this type of context, but um, uh, we're going to need to recognize that this matrix here, this Jacobian, will vary uh, for different values of s. How much s is changing um, uh, over time, the rate at which it's changing, you know, the, the, the chance per unit time a, a person in s goes to i, will vary based on how many people there are in i and how many people there are in s and how many are in, in r. So um, Jacobian will, will vary. Now, what we do here is we look around equilibria because we know at equilibria, if we consider things in the vicinity of equilibrium, we know that basically this term is going to be equal to zero um, because we have this system where uh, S dot equals F of S. And we know at an equilibrium, by definition, the system's in balance. In other words, S dot, is equal to zero. Um, this, there's no change in the first element of S, let's say X, no change in the second Y, and no change in the third Z. Or to risk confusion with SIR, there's no change in S, no change in I, no change in R. So S dot at an equilibrium, uh, which is F of S, has got to be equal to zero. So if we look at an equilibrium, we could consider what's going on right around that equilibrium. Okay, now um, this, uh, this gives us just this Jacobian times how far we are from the equilibrium, S minus this equilibrium point S star. Okay, we're using S star to indicate the location of the equilibrium. And then we've got some higher order terms uh, uh, that, that involve things like uh, uh, the X component, the delta X, S minus X, S star for X, uh, which is some delta X squared, or S minus S star for X times S minus S star, the Y component of it. Um, and if, if, if we're very close to S star, those are going to be very small terms, like S minus uh, S star, the X component of that will be very small, maybe it would be 0.01. And if we square it, we'll get something really, really small, like point, instead of being 0.01, it'll be 0 0.001 um, and uh, so on. Um, so, so here, excuse me, 0 0.0001. Um, so uh, from 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus four. So these terms are very, very small if S is close to the equilibrium. If, if we're looking very close to the equilibrium, basically what we get is something similar to the linear case uh, at the, at the um, uh, right around that equilibrium. So 
we can use that whole linear analysis we went through with taking it apart into uh, to these eigenvectors right around the equilibrium. We know that right around this equilibrium, the system's in balance, this term goes away, and it's dictated by this Jacobian and ultimately by its so-called eigenmodes. It's, it's kind of eigenvectors and, and how they evolve according to the eigenvalues. Okay, so we're coming up to, to applications of this. Let's first look at a system that's uh, an SIRS system. So here we have susceptibles, infectives, and recoveds. Um, and we've dealt with this system before, solving it for equilibrium. Um, let's, let's take a look at it for, with this lens, if we could. So um, I've taken the liberty of, of associating with certain values here. So for example, beta times C um, uh, times uh, one over the, um, the population is, is minus point, is 0.01. Um, so if we expand this in a certain way and we reflect the fact that, well, we can deal with S plus I plus R is equal to the total population. So all we need to do is worry about S and I and we'll lend the value X for susceptible and Y for infective. We get this formula here, okay? Um, now we could compute the Jacobian of this. Um, and what we'll find is that well, before the Jacobian was always fixed numbers. You may remember that it was things like this or things like uh, this. Here, the Jacobian will depend on system state. We said that earlier, that's a feature of nonlinear systems. Um, and it's not surprising how many people get infected or that the chance a given susceptible will get infected per unit time will depend on the number of infected. And indeed it does here, this term comes from exactly this. We're taking this derivative with respect to x. We get minus 0.01y. Um, and, and then there's this other term reflecting outflows. But the point is that, um, or another outflow, that's uh, an outflow associated with, um, uh, that is in, uh, OK, I think this is actually combining um, Mumble. Oh, yes, this is from the R component, which we're leaving out uh, explicitly over where we've just expanded that. So this is minus 0.01 times Y uh, as the value of the Jacobian. So as Y, in other words, the number infected change, this uh, element of the Jacobian will change. As X changes, this will change, this will change, and this will change. Okay. So in state space, the system will evolve towards some equilibria and it will have in fact, two fixed points, okay? One of them will be a disease free equilibrium. That's this one, everyone's susceptible, no one is infective, no one is recovered or a system, uh, a, a, a situation where um, there's quite a few people infected, there's very few people susceptible and the balance of the people, which is the large majority, 910, remain recovered. Um, that's just 1,000 minus uh, this minus that. Okay, um, what are the eigenvalues for each of these? Well, now we're going to have, for each equilibrium, we're going to have eigenvalues associated with it, okay? Um, now, this Jacobian is going to depend on system state. So... What are its eigenvalues? Well, it's gonna depend on where we are in system state. And we're concentrating here on the equilibria, two equilibria, disease-free and endemic. And for each of them, this will have eigen, uh, eigenvalues. So let's, let's look at each of these. For the disease-free equilibrium, we have this, um, everyone is susceptible. X equals a thousand, Y equals zero, and, and R equals zero. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so the eigenvalues here uh, are going to be minus 0.01 and 9.9. .9. And what that's indicating is one of these eigenmodes is slowly decaying around this, around this point. Uh, if we're in the vicinity of this point, one is slowly decaying, but one will be expanding rapidly. So tell me, ladies and gentlemen, make an utterance. 
uh, uh, in the closing minutes of class. Is this system stable or unstable? If we have one negative, uh, one value, uh, eigenvalue whose real component is negative, but one that's positive, is this unstable or stable? Unstable. Unstable. It's unstable. It's going to rapidly diverge. It's going to explode. It's going to explode really quickly. 9.9, um, .9, if, if that's per day, we're in trouble because it's going gonna, it's gonna, to like, grow with a wicked vengeance. Um, uh, and, and so this is highly unstable. What this is saying is the disease free equilibrium is not stable. Our public health efforts are not good enough to prevent it from just everything going to hell in a handbasket if, if someone comes in sick um, to the population or if you get a couple of people on a flight coming in. Um, we're, we're in trouble uh, here with the disease free equilibrium because we're in an equilibrium as long as this is true things are hunky dory, but as soon as we have someone come in infective, it's gonna explode. And in fact, the eigenvector uh, associated with that uh, is, going to, um, is, is going to grow very quickly. And that eigenvector is associated with uh, a, a growing number, I, I don't dare point at it again, it's, it's, the, right, it's the right element of this, this matrix being obscured. Um, uh, it's going to be growing, that's the lower right corner of it, growing infectives as susceptible shrink. That's the upper left, uh, the upper right corner. Um, so it's a negative minus 0.71 and below it is 0 0.70. So what this is indicating is uh, with this eigen mode, the system is going to be exploding the number of infectives and reducing the number of susceptibles, which is exactly what you see in an infectious disease outbreak. On the right, what you're going to see is there's some um, uh, there's there's some decaying component associated with um, another eigen eigenvector associated with a, a die off in the number of or reduction in the number of of susceptibles um, uh, that, that were there initially. Um, okay, but let's look at the fixed point, the equilibria uh, for endemic, where the system is, uh, is in balance, uh, but it's in balance with disease remaining in the population. So here we have susceptibles 10, infectives 90, and the balance, the recovered's being 9 under 10, right? Oh, excuse me, 900. What am I doing? Um, so it's 1,000 minus 10 minus 90, uh, 900. Um, okay, eigenvalues here are minus 0.78 and minus 1.26, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this is indicating stability or instability. It is... Stability. It's stable. Stability. It's stable. It's pulling it back. Um, what this is indicating is, you know, there's nothing that's going to explode. All the eigen modes, all the all the sort of characteristics behaviors of the system are are pulling it back into um, into uh, alignment. It's like a whole bunch. What this is telling you is, it's a whole bunch of negative feedback loops. They're they're sort of pulling it back, any, any disturbance around this. If you have too many infectives, infections going on, it'll drain susceptibles, which will undercut the ability for future infections. If you have too few infections, you'll build up the number of susceptibles, which will uh, lead to more infections or bring it back into this balance. This is a stable state. It's a, it's a stable state of the system. And you can see that around this point, there's two eigen modes. This point is right here. Um, there's two eigen modes here, um, uh, right around it, and one of them is going to be uh, on the left, uh, having uh, fewer susceptibles and growing a larger number of of, of infectives. Um, presumably, that's associated with some replenishment of susceptibles uh, uh, from from recovered. And on the right one, you're going to have um, some decrease in infectives while uh, only having a modest increase in, in number of susceptibles. 
one would have to go interpret those, but right around this point, there's kind of going to be two natural modes of the system. And those are independent. Right around that point, they they sort of uh, pass like ships in the night. They're, they're each operating around that point in a way that will suck towards that point. This point is an attractor. It'll suck things towards it. This point is a repeller. If you set something here and you let it go, a, a new, new infective, it'll kick it off aggressively in this direction. Um, it'll it'll aggressively kick it off in this direction of lowered susceptibles, increased infectives, and which is exactly what you see right there in the right hand column of that matrix down here at the bottom. Um, um, oh man, this 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 column which you can't see because of this this dumb um, widget. Uh, so um, that uh, uh, that. Okay, now it comes back again. Um, so, uh, so it's that exact right-hand column that dictates why this is shooting up like this uh, in this direction. That eigen mode is, is expansive. It's just exploding and it'll be pushing away from it there. By contrast, it's sucking in from a different direction. There's actually, you can see it exactly here. It's sucking in along this axis. So along the axis, which is dictated by the first column of that matrix, which is forever covered, the, the one and zero, it's sucking towards larger number of susceptibles. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's sucking it towards this point of a thousand susceptibles uh, associated with um, sort of a replenishment of, of susceptibles there. Okay. I've gone on too long, but um, uh, what this is showing is I want a few take home big messages. I know there's been a god awful lot of math. Um, uh, this will be useful for a problem you'll be giving. Number two, stability is dictated by eigenvalues. And if, all, if the real part of all of them is negative, then um, it'll be stable. If the real part of any of them is positive, it'll be unstable. And you can get in these, these states, which are somewhere in between with the spiraling and where in fact you get a perfectly spiral behavior in some cases, which is neither stable nor unstable. It's, uh, it's sort of circularly stable in a dynamic equilibrium. Um, this is made possible by linearization around equilibria. In general, the behavior of these nonlinear systems will vary a lot over state space. But if we look at them right around equilibria, we can understand them with the tools we use for linear systems. And a key element of those tools is this Jacobian matrix, which describes how, how does rate of change in the, in the uh, state factors vary with um, changes in the value of of, of how many people there are in each each state or, or the, the, the value of, of the state, the components of the state, say X, Y, Z, or S, I, and R. Um, okay, I've kept you all together too long and I've kept you all together too painfully probably, um, but um, this gives a glimpse at least of some more advanced topics within infectious disease modeling and I haven't even emphasized how you can compute these things uh, symbolically, which is very, very powerful. Um, that will be all for today, though. Um, and uh, I'll be starting my office hours shortly um, and look forward to answering questions there. So I'll be back in about five minutes uh, for office hours. Thanks very much, and thanks for your patience.